Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. We're yes. on. And today's guest, we've got UFC legend Michael Bisping. Thank you, James. Thanks for having. Thanks for coming on. My I, pleasure. I was just about to say thanks for having me there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relax, calm down. <laughs> I like you've been here before. <laughs> How you been, brother? I'm good. I'm good. Very, we were just saying a moment ago before we started. Very, very busy. Obviously promoting this film here, which is uh, a sentence I never thought I'd be saying. You know, promoting a documentary about my life. Uh, yeah, things are great. Incredibly busy, which is a blessing. It, it is. I, uh, you know, I never take anything for granted. As a former fighter or a former athlete, you know, you always kind of worry what you're going to do afterwards, you know, and certainly for me, I was always worried, you know, what am I going to do when it's all over? And yeah, things are good. Things are really, really good. So yeah, to answer your question in a long roundabout way, I'm good. Good on you. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah. 45 minutes away from here, a little town called Clitheroe. Uh, I mean, I was born in Cyprus on an army base, but you know, grew up in Clitheroe. Yeah, you know, I just, uh, just, uh, I mean, if you watch the film, you'll know all about it. But uh, just, you know, just a very, very average young lad, just getting in a few scraps here and there and whatnot. You know, did martial arts when I was a kid and loved that. Left school at 16. Nothing, nothing, uh, nothing particularly noteworthy, to be honest. Who were you at school? Hmm? How were well you at school? How was I at school? Yeah. So that's a quick the fucking accent you got there, Gibbs. <laughs> <laughs> How was I at school? Yeah, yeah no, no, I, I had good grades. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't um, stupid or anything, but I wasn't a star pupil, let's be honest. Well, I was a terrible pupil. I didn't care about school. I never applied myself whatsoever. And that's one of my biggest regrets, to be honest. Uh, but, but I, I, you know, I, I didn't have a bad brain on me. So I still somehow, somehow managed to get decent GCSEs when I left school, even though, uh, weirdly enough, I was quite proud of this. I went through five years of uh, secondary school without doing homework once. But in our house, it was such a volatile household. It wasn't really like you could sit down at the dining room table and do your homework. It was kicking off all the time. Um, but when I left school, as I say, I got some decent GCSEs. So I went to college for a little bit, a little bit. I went to Blackburn College, uh, but and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I remember looking at a college prospectus and my dad, because I got decent GCSEs, I could qualify for the advanced electronical engineering course, right? I've got no interest in electronical engineering. I know nothing about it. And I had no business being on the advanced course. Everyone else on the course had already done a year to get to that point, but I had decent grades. So I, had, so I qualified for it, did not understand anything. It was all well over my head, far too you know, advanced for me. Because I didn't understand, I stopped listening. I was more obsessed with being a DJ back in the day, so I just listened to my own mixes at the back of the classroom. And then I just stopped going, you know. I remember my dad, he was like, are you going to college? I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course I am. And there was this little cafe by the bus stop, and he'd come and sit in this cafe just to make sure I was getting on the bus. I'd give the bus driver 20p and get off at the next stop, and then I'd just walk around for hours on end. So, yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was my college experience. And your dad, he was a sniper? Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough fucking job. I've had a couple of snipers on the podcast, and they struggle mentally as well. That, did that play a major effect on yourself as a kid? No, not. So, I mean, because that was all done and dusted by the time I grew up. You know what I mean? But that was in the army. I, I, I was born in an army base, so I don't remember any of that. But 
you know, I talked about this in the film a little bit, you know, it, it, it was, you know, my mom and dad loved us daily, you know, and I'm not here to shit on my parents. They did the best by us, you know. Times were hard. Money was tight. We had six, you know, they had six kids, so a family of eight, and he spent 22 years in the army, and then you just get fucking cast aside. Do you know what I mean? And he went from being a sergeant major in the army and a sniper to all of a sudden working as a petrol pump attendant. Do you know what I mean? And I can only imagine what that must have been like. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not making excuses for him because there was violence in the house. You know, there was a lot of violence in the house, you know, but uh, I'm sure he was going through some kind of depression, and PTSD. He was, he was, you know, he was involved in some heavy stuff. I know that now as a man, you know, so I'm sure, you know, he, he was dealing with his own stuff. You know, because my, my dad's great. You know, my dad, my dad supported me every step of the way. And, uh, you know, he's part of the reason why I'm standing here having this conversation with you now. Because when he realized I had a flair for martial arts as a kid, he would drive me all over the place. He did with all of us. You know, with Conrad, he was good at rugby and canoeing. And again, he, he did everything he could to support us. Yeah, he had a temper. Yeah, he was a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a madman, do you know what I mean? But he loved us dearly and passionately, do you know what I mean? And yeah, he was quick with his fists and whatnot, do you know what I mean? But it was also a different time and I'm not excusing him, do you know what I mean? It was kind of accepted back then, wasn't it? it? Yeah, 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 weirdly enough, mm -hmm. weirdly enough, do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not justifying what he did, do you know what I mean? But yeah, it was a little different and my dad was a bit extreme, do you know what I mean? But yeah, cr giving your kids a crack around the head wasn't... Uh, frowned upon not that, I mean ours was a little bit different I remember uh, I hope he doesn't see this but, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember uh, my son he wrestles uh, in uh, he's at college in San Francisco and he, he he came out to watch one of his wrestling tournaments and we were sitting at the hotel and we were having a beer and I hadn't seen him in ages and we just got chatted about old times right and I said oh remember that time dad uh, the TV license inspector you know what I mean? Because money was tight, so my, we never had a fucking TV license. And uh, I come up in from school, and there's a guy in a suit sitting there in our front room. And 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 uh, lo and behold, it was the TV license inspector. But I didn't know. And my dad's sitting there saying, yeah, we've got a TV, but we don't watch it. You know what I mean? We don't use it because we haven't got a license. You know, we're very honest. And I walk in from school and just walk in, plunk, plunk the TV on straight away. So my dad fucking lost his mind. And when the fucking TV license inspector left, you know, he kicked off, picked me up above his head, threw me head first into the washing machine, split my head open, blood everywhere and whatnot. I said, and we just got talking about that somehow. And my dad goes, yeah, good times, good times. <laughs> I said, good times. Uh, I said, maybe for fucking you. Uh, but yeah, there you go. That's kind of like what it was like. In do you think house. those experiences those always set you up to who you were today? Like being a tough bastard and kind of not backing down. At, do you think yeah, all that you know, shit? 100%. As I say, I, I love my dad. I love my mum and dad. My mum was just as bad as my dad, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, w without question. Without question, you know, I mean, I guess you kind of get used to getting fucking hit in the head. I have a lot of older brothers as well. And listen, I, 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 you know, I was always getting in fights as well. But I, that's all I'd seen, do you know what I mean? I'm not making excuses for it because I'm responsible for my own actions. But I thought it was kind of normal to get into a fight. I thought it was kind of normal to, uh, you know, if you had a problem to use your fist because that's what I saw in the house, do you know what I mean? So obviously I was getting in a lot of fights and... From there, you end up getting in trouble. You know what I mean? Trouble with the police and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, yeah, of course. That, that, but but I always had a flair for martial arts as well. I was good at that and I loved it because I wasn't good at sports. I was terrible at sports. You know what I mean? I had two left feet when it came to football and wasn't particularly coordinated. I was kind of clumsy and whatnot. But when I started doing martial arts, I'd found something I was good at. Do you know what I mean? And it, 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 was, a, it was a great feeling. So all that stuff together and of course... Getting your face smashed in off your mum and dad on a daily basis doesn't hurt. You ended up in the jail, was it for 28 days? Yeah. What was that for? Kicking someone in the head? Yeah, well, it was actually a public order offence. Do you know what I mean? So no one pressed charges because uh, they started it all, but I finished it. Self-defence? Well, it, well it, 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 it was self-defence, but it was. I walked into a toilet and my mate was on the floor and there was two guys kicking the shit out of him. So obviously, and I went, I went to break it up and then boom, another one of their mates punched me in the back of the head. So it all kicked off and then we got outside and... Yeah, I ended up kicking one of them in the head and, you know, police pulled up and everyone legged it. This copper says, saw the whole thing, Michael. No point running. And I thought, yeah, there's no point. This is a small town. They're going to be waiting for me outside my house. And went to court. And as I say, it was only a public order offence, but 
it was the straw that brought the camels back. You know what I mean? I'd been there a few times and the judge was like, this guy's not learning. You know what I mean? So he, he uh, gave me a little sentence. And to be honest, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It right. really was because I, I, I wasn't learning and I was very flipping and I just, I didn't care, you know? And I had a, Beautiful girlfriend. She's now my wife. We had two. No, sorry, we didn't have two kids. What am I saying? But she was pregnant with with my first boy with Callum, and I was still acting like a dickhead. Do you know what I mean? I was still very immature. And when I went to prison, I remember sitting in the holding cell before they put, take you to your cell and whatnot, and just looking around and thinking, "Wow, is this it? Is this what my life's destined to be? Fucking sitting in a Preston prison." surrounded by no offense to any prisoners the dregs of society you know i remember some guy came oh you're all right man what are you in for I'm like, fuck <laughs> off don't fucking speak to me i'm not one of you and i said to myself there and then that day i said right that's it i've got to make a change this is not what i want for my life this is not who i want to be uh, so as i say you know i, I i'm right in a roundabout way grateful to that judge because he definitely taught me a lesson so what was the plan of action when you came out then your missus is pregnant your mum and dad probably feel let down as well that you're 28 days, it's fuck all basically, but it's still enough to say that could have been the start of something where you're going to be in there yeah. more frequently. What was the plan of action for yourself to say, fuck this, I'm screwing the head? Yeah, well, 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 well as you say, 28 days, I mean, it's nothing really. Uh, but as you say, next time, it would have been six months and then two years and whatever. And before you know it, you're a career criminal that's just fucking getting locked up and spending your time in prison for going out on the sesh and then end up getting in scraps. Do you know what I mean? That's not what you want out of life. Uh, so the first thing was to get a job and just hold down a fucking job. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't care. I mean, I was just doing dead end jobs and the way I thought about it was, well, if I lose one, I'll, they're easy to come by. Do you know what I mean? So I, I got a job working at a, an upholstery factory as a quality control inspector. Uh, and, you know, and I was doing that for a couple of years. And, you know, it was, it was, I, I, I was all right, but I was like, there's got to be more to life than this. And I remember... This guy, Mick Colleen, he was my supervisor at the time. And he came up to me and he said, Mike, he said, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? I said, no. He said, well, you need to give it some thought. He said, because before you know it, 20 years are going to pass by just like that, you know? And I did think about it and I think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do in my life? And I was doing some soul searching. And then I went up to him one day. I said, hey, Mick, I figured it out what I'm going to do. And he goes, oh, what's that? And he takes his tool belt off and he's walking over. What's the big idea then? I said, I'm going to be a professional fighter. And he was like, oh, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, trust me, Mick, I, I know what I'm talking about here. And he, he he did, he thought I was out of my mind. He thought, this guy's a fucking idiot. Do you know? You know? And that's what everyone thought. And uh, I was given an opportunity by one of my old senseis when I was a kid. I'd never even heard of the UFC. I mean, no, sorry, that's a lie. I'd heard of it, but I wasn't conscious of it. I'd heard of it when it first came out. But I wasn't aware of it. You know, it wasn't something I was looking at or considering. But he told me all about it. And he said, Michael, there's a lot of money to be earned. You know, he said, the people in America, if you become a champion, he said, you'll you'll be fucking acting in movies. You, you're bona fide celebrities. You make money and all the rest of it. And I was like, well, I've got fuck all else going for me. I'll, I'll give it a shot. And uh, yeah, so everyone was laughing at me. All the lads at work, I said, I'm quitting work. I'm moving away. I'm going to become a professional fighter. And everyone, I knew everyone was talking shit. Everyone was laughing at me. Even my own mates, even a lot of people, you know, that close to me in my hometown were like, what's he doing? They're already skinny and he's quitting work to become a professional fighter. Oh, what, because he thinks he's hard. Do, do you know what mm. I mean? Uh, but yeah. Who yeah. was that for you to try and prove people wrong? No, I, I, I didn't care. That, that wasn't my mission. I wasn't trying to prove people wrong. I was trying to, I was trying to prove myself right, if you will. I, I was, I was trying to, you know, trying to make something of myself, but more importantly, provide for my children and my wife, you know. How and, old were you? Uh, 20, 20, this was 2003 to 24. That's when you went into the contender? Yeah, the ultimate, well, no, yeah. So this guy said, if you if you quit work and, and let me train you, he said, if you get to top five in the country, I'll pay your loss of earnings. That was the deal he made me. And I said, well, I thought, I know I can be top five in the country. I know I can. So I quit work. I started training down in Nottingham Monday to Friday. I'd come back at the weekends and do a bit of DJing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, within two years, I think I had 10 professional fights. So I became the Cage Warriors champion, Cage Rage champion, FX3 champion, British kickboxing champion. So things were going well. And then, yeah, they came out to uh, the UK looking for two guys for the ultimate fighter. So down at Earl's Court, we had open auditions. But everyone else auditioning, I knocked them all out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I was like, yeah, I'm a shoe in here. So 
Yeah, that's that's how that came about. What was that feeling for you to be going over to the States? Mate, unreal. Unreal. Like it's a, there's a little bit of it on the documentary where this van pulls up outside the house. For those that don't know, it's like Big Brother, except every week two guys fight. And I've never even been to America in my life. Do you know what I mean? And now here I am in Las Vegas. It's a massive mansion on a reality TV show. Uh, getting to fight. And it was just the most exciting, unbelievable experience of my life. It, it, it was, it was, yeah, I loved it. I mean, it was lonely, you know what I mean? No contact with the outside world and all the rest of it, but it was a crazy experience and and I, I loved it, yeah. Because UFC wasn't big then, it was kind of on its ass, was it not? And that show kind of changed the game for it, man, and, and gave it the platform to then kick on. Yeah. It's ex unbelievable. Ex exactly. For those that don't know, uh, so Dana White and the Fatita brothers, they bought the UFC, I think it was 2003, and they changed it, you know, they brought in all the athletic commissions because back in the day, there was no rules pretty much. There was no time limits. There was no weight classes. So they tried to mold it into a proper sport and got the athletic commissions involved and they believed in it. But uh, at one point, they were like $45 million in debt, you know? And they were like, right, what can we do? Because the UFC wasn't even allowed on, on TV. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't even allowed on cable TV in, in America. Porn was, but the UFC wasn't allowed. Excuse me. So they thought, right, we'll do this reality TV. This was their final attempt. They said, right, well, we'll put some money into this. God knows how many million. Uh, we'll put some money into this. But if this doesn't work, that's it. And uh, they had the first season of The Ultimate Fighter. I was on season three. But the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, uh, the final was two guys called Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin. And they fought, and it was on Spike TV, which is like a regular TV channel in America. And when the fight was happening, because it was a crazy fight, like the, the viewing figures just went crazy and people were calling each other up and saying, have you seen this fight on this channel? And, and it just exploded from there. And that is what saved the UFC. And then from there, it just became this... You know, not overnight success, but that was the true turning point. And then season two, three, four, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger to what it is today. And you won it. You were the first British person ever to win it. Yeah, yeah. Season three, I went out there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. And how was that connected to the final match? Knowing there's a six figure deal there for you, change your life. Your missus is there, who stuck by you, thinking Finlay. Like, did you feel a lot more pressure then than you did when you were fighting for the world title? I felt tremendous pressure. You know what I mean? Because um, at that point, you know. It's still a million miles away from you know having any kind of success in my life. Yeah, I'd had a few fights and I maybe had a bit of TV time. Do you know what I mean? But that's not what I was trying to achieve. I remember when I was at the final in Las Vegas, and uh, right before we started, I was like looking at the lights and stuff, and I was like, I was, oh, I was like fucking uh, like I was gonna faint. And, <laughs> and the coach at the time said, Michael, 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 just remember. Every training session that you've ever done all comes down to this moment. I'm like, fucking hell, leave off, mate. I see you're not helping. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're pouring the pressure on it, yeah. Jesus. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was uh yeah, it was a good time. And then when you won that, you got your deal when you won your first is it six, seven fights in the UFC? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I had my first fight at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, two thousand and six. Uh yeah, then I'm the first one in Manchester after that. Yeah, uh, lost to Rashad Evans, there's his name on there contentious split decision you know what I mean uh, it was a very very close fight but he got me so after that I moved down to middleweight because I was a little small for light heavyweight yeah what was it like getting your first loss well I mean it's cliche to say but you learn from your losses you know I mean when you're winning fights it's fantastic but if if anything you might develop bad habits or whatever because you're getting away with it you know you're doing great when I lost to Rashad obviously uh, I went 15 and 0 you know, so I had a good run, but I, I was like, right, you got to do some, you know, you're going to look at yourself, you've got to analyze why you lost. And the first thing that stuck out was that I was too small for the weight class because on the day of the weigh-ins, he was sitting in a sauna trying to dehydrate himself like 20 pounds. And I was uh, sitting in a Chinese restaurant eating noodles and drinking 7-Up. And I, well, I said, well, I'm not making all the sacrifices I can do, I, I can make to be the best version of myself, am I? So, yeah, you know, I moved out to middleweight and every time I lost you know you always you know you learn a little bit you, you you tweak this you do that you know the diet was wrong I overtrained I was a little weak I need to do more of this my cardio wasn't good you know what I mean and it's it's, it's a work in progress you know so that's why you know I, I won the belt late in my career you know I think I was I'm one of the oldest guys to do it to become champ but that, that's why because every you know you learn as you go along and for me the main thing that I learned was about the mentality of it 
You know, I mean, obviously, fighting is a very physical sport, but the mind controls everything. And I used to be an emotional wreck. Yeah, I still am in many ways. You know, my emotions were always all over the place. And if you go into a fight too emotional, too highly strong, angry, whatever, those kind of emotions only impact you negatively. How do you deal with that? Yeah, well, well. Uh, fortunately, I met a great coach, Jason Perillo, who's kind of like a mentor to me, and he just, he just he was very patient. He just worked with me, and you know, like for example, I remember uh, when I got the world title fight, two weeks notice, I was doing this film. Came from set, sounds very loud. I fucking die. I apologize. Um, came from set, and I went straight to the gym, and I was training. And I was doing jujitsu with my jujitsu coach, and he's very good. That's why he's my jujitsu coach, and he was getting me a little bit, and I was like fucking I was stressed out because because of the pressure I want to do good I wasn't stressing at him but I was stressing at him but he wasn't the reason and anyway Prillo says to me he says he says Mike look listen he said you're fighting for the world title in two weeks time he said we think you're going to win we're your coaches he said but you might not you know, right you might not win he said and if you don't win this is it this is the pinnacle of your career you're in a great position you're the main event you're fighting for the world championship you're on pay-per-view your face is on the poster you're going to fight on TV all over the world. It's a great position to be in. Many people want to be in that position. He said, so how about we fucking enjoy it? He said, oh, we can go through these next two weeks with you spazzing out and all being angry and we all arguing or whatever, or we can enjoy the process. It's up to you. You know, I was like, do you know what? You're absolutely right. My God. And just when you look at it from a different perspective, look at it through a different lens, it just changes your perspective on everything and and then from that day forward we went then like the kind of the the pressure was kind of eradicated a little bit i was like all right no i am in a good position this is incredible this is fun you know i am a lucky man do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that kind of changed everything Vito Belfort, yeah was... no i mean yeah he's, he's well known for taking a lot of steroids but um um <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I just wanted to ask myself a question there about something I've written, uh, something I said earlier <laughs> I hope it doesn't get taken out of context anyway uh, you, you can see it anyway fast, yeah no no it. no I, I, I said he's a fucking juice monkey do you know what I mean that's an expression isn't it do you know what yeah. I mean I was like is that, is that going to get twisted it shouldn't yeah, racism. yeah there's yeah, nothing yeah, fucking yeah. racist about it do you know what I mean uh, but anyway yeah no he takes a lot of steroids he's well known he's, he's a prolific cheat uh, he's been banned multiple times and uh, he um yeah, he, he kicked me in the head. But you know what? I mean, I knew he was probably going to be on steroids. But that's the arrogance of a fighter. Do you know what I mean? It's like, all right, well, whatever. You know, that's his weakness. You know, he, he feels the need to do that. I don't feel the need. And uh, yeah, you know, he kicked me in the head. And my retina detached. And that's when you lost your eye? Yeah. This is what some story I fucking about it. It's unbelievable to lose your eye, keep fighting, yeah. kind of lying, cheating. That's kind of the bad boy for the back in the day. It's probably gave you that incentive to cut corners and kind of find a way to fucking succeed like when you're going through that and Dana White phones you to say look your career's over and every, your career was just kind of flourishing then you were yeah. kind of starting getting into the limelight like how was that feeling then when you think did you know automatically right it's finished or did you think fuck this like it's not over yeah no no I was just talking about this a second ago uh, when Dana called me you know he's wearing different hats because Dan is obviously the president of the UFC, but he's also been a really good friend to me over the years as well. I've got tremendous respect for him. So when he called me, yeah, he was calling me as the UFC and my, uh, as my promoter to say, listen, you can't fight anymore. But he was also talking to me as a friend saying, Mike, your eyes fucked. You're never going to fight again. So for me, uh, it, it was it was tough to take, you know, and I was fighting back the tears. I remember I was outside Target. I just nipped down with my wife. I think we were just buying some whatever it was for the house, toilet roll or something. And, uh, uh, and you know, and then he's telling me that my career's over and I was fighting about the tears and I went to see the doctor and, uh, you know, to get confirmation. And yeah, he was like, yeah, you need to have 2200 vision to be cleared to fight, which is still classed as clinically blind, but still, you know, it is a requirement. Um, but he said, he gave me a little glimmer of hope. He said, you know, he said, sometimes I have seen it. If people, you know, rest they don't do anything they don't get the heart rate up they really take it easy sometimes it can improve it's, it's very rare but sometimes it can improve well that was it that was the glimmer of hope that's all i needed do you know what i mean so i i spent the next best part of a year literally sitting on a couch depressed as fuck drinking a lot do you know what i mean going through uh yeah some some dark times do you know what i mean feeling sorry for myself basically uh you know 
because my career had been taken away. And as you say, I was just starting, everything was going great. Everything was going, we just moved to America, you know, it's all an exciting time. And then all of a sudden we move out there and, and then all this, you know, uh, and, and the eye wasn't getting better. In fact, if anything, it was getting worse and it slowly, slowly got worse. And this is a prosthetic lens. It looks terrible without it in. Um, and yeah, so I thought, well, fuck it. You know, I got to do what I got to do. Yeah. So I got to start lying and cheating and scamming the test. And as you say, you know, all, all those years of being a little scally kind of paid off. You know what I mean? Cause you know, doctors are kind of nerds. Do you know what I mean? You can pull the wool over their eyes. Yeah, silly <laughs> bastards, isn't it? Yeah, they're smart. They're not street smart. Do you know what I mean? I'm fucking bullshit a doctor all day long. See, when you're going through your depression there for a year and you're boozing and kind of probably putting on weight, how does that affect your wife and your kids? Like seeing their dad who's active and always kind of front stage and you've headlined so many fucking events that like, how is that when that's taken away from you can you can you see a part of that in your dad as well being with the adrenaline rush being a sniper and then it getting took away from him and then he's pumping gas like yeah did you see a, a kind of resemblance I, there well not yeah until you just mentioned it now yeah i never saw a parallel in that but i can kind of see it uh i see i see the angle you're coming from I mean, in terms of my wife, I mean, she was, I mean, she, she's, she's incredible. I don't deserve her. She's, she's just, she's been my absolute rock and, and, and she doesn't want anything from me. You know, she doesn't, she has no expectations or anything. She's the best person, the best thing that ever happened to me. And she was just so supportive the whole time. Do you know what I mean? All she wanted was, and still to this day, just what's best for me. Couldn't care less about money or anything like that. That doesn't excite her. I keep telling her, like, she, she doesn't want me to work so much right now. I'm like, babe. Who the fuck do you think is paying for your horse, <laughs> like, horse riding lessons? Do you know what yeah. I mean? There's not a money tree. Do you know what I mean? That stupid car that you drive. Anyway, but but she doesn't care. And the point I'm making is like, she was just supportive from day one and whatever was best for me. And then when I when I decided I was going to carry on fighting and I was trying to, I mean, what happened was I, I went to the doctor one day and I kept going every week and every week and you're sitting in there and it's all like, you know, people that are in the 80s and 90s with cataracts and stuff like that. And I would sit there in these waiting rooms. I think I'd feel sorry for myself. You know, I'm like, look at all these people that are at the end of their life. I'm in my prime. I'm a professional athlete. I'm a fighter. And I'm sitting here with these old biddies. Do you know what I mean? I don't deserve to be here. You know, I was, you know, feeling sorry for myself, you know. And uh, I was going back week after week after week. And one day I went in and my regular doctor wasn't there. This other guy was there. He said, Michael, he said, you keep coming. I see you on the records. You come every week. Well, why do you come in? I said, Doc. I said, I've got to fight again. Do you know what I mean? I said, uh, I'm just coming. I'm trying to see if there's been a little bit of improvement. As soon as you say there's an improvement, boom, I'm back. Do you know what I mean? And he said to me, he said, all right, well, why don't you start training? Why don't you start training and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I said, hold on a minute. I said, I've been told that I can't even get my heart rate up. I said, and now you're telling me I can start training. And he says to me, he says, Michael, my dad always said, and I say this in the film, he said, there's two types of men in the jungle. First man swings through the jungle on a vine and waits until they have hold of another one before they let go of that one. He said, the other man swings through the jungle, lets go of the vine, and they hope that they catch the other one. He said, something tells me you're that second type of man, Michael. I said, I fucking am, doctor. He said, all right. He said, well, start training again, and then, you know, we'll see what happens. And what happened from there is I started training. I called the UFC and said, I'm, you know, I'm back. And then they went, hold on, we've got to get your eyes checked. I'm like, shit. And they sent me to doctors of their choosing and whatnot. And yeah, as I said, just totally blagged it, bullshitted, lied, guessed. You know, there was one test. You have to put your eyes in this thing and like these little lights line light up. And when you see one, you have one in your left hand, one in your right hand. And when you see a little light, you push it, but you just got to look forward. Obviously I can't see past my nose. Here. I can't see my hand there at all. So on this side, I had no fucking idea, but I'm looking at like the rhythm and the timing on that side. And I'm like, think just like guessing it mm. fucking past. <laughs> do you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then like, sometimes I just memorize the eye test. You know, I, I saw this sweet Indian doctor and I went in, and of course, he doesn't know I'm trying to blag the test. He thinks I'm trying to check on my eyes like a normal person. Do you know what I mean? So he covers up because I remember he went, he, he walked this old guy, the patient that was there first. He walked him out to his car and he said, you go sit, sit down in my office, make yourself comfortable. And I thought, fucking jackpot. So I go in and there's the eye chart there. It was like an old fashioned one. It was like, it wasn't digital, excuse me. And uh, all I got to know is the top letter, which is massive. 
and then the two bigger ones underneath it. I don't need to know the rest of them. I know that that's 2200 vision. You just got to know those top three letters. So I just memorize them like C, D, E, spin it round, F, L, M, whatever. So I just memorize all three. And uh, he covers up my bad eye first. And he says, right, what can you see? And I'm like, go down the whole list. And he doesn't spin it round or anything. And he covers up my other eyes. Like, right, what can you see? And this is where those couple of shitty acting lessons paid off. I'm like, C, D, E. I'm like, oh, it's getting a bit blurry now, dog. Oh, and he goes, right. He says, well, you've passed. You've passed. He said, but you shouldn't fight. He said, if anything happens to your other eye, he said, you're going to go blind. He said, do not fight. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, you're right, dog. I'll give it some thought. I'll talk it over with my family. And yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. But then I walked out. I was like, fucking come on. Because I'd been licensed, you know. But it was just that kind of scenario over and over and over again. The stress was crazy. Do you know what I mean? For me, the fighting was the easy part. The fighting was, the, that, was the, that was easy. Do you know what I mean? That was like, well, finally I made it. The hard part was getting to the fight. You know what I mean? And conning everyone and lying to everyone and bullshitting the whole time. Do you know what I mean? It was very stressful. How do you think your life would have been if you never got back fighting? Oh, um, well, at the time, we just moved out to America and we just bought this sh big stupid house that we didn't need, you know. Uh, I had a lawsuit going on with a former manager that was total lies and bullshit. I'm happy to say that just got thrown out recently and he owes me a ton of money. But at the time, you know, lawsuits, you got you to gotta fight them, otherwise you lose. And it was total lies and it was totally made up and totally fabricated. So that was costing a lot of money. So to answer your question, if I hadn't got back fighting, I don't know, I'd probably be back in Clitheroe now. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'd like to see maybe doing something better, but you know, probably just living a normal life, having a job. I would have, you know, had a little stint as a UFC fighter. Maybe I would have, maybe I'd be training people, something like that, maybe. But at mm -hmm. that time, I didn't have any of the opportunities that I have now, you know, and, and in many ways, I'm grateful for what happened with my eye because that, I, I knew my fight career was on borrowed time. I knew that any moment, the rug was going to be pulled from under my feet and they were going to say, hold on a minute, you can't fucking see. You can't fight. Do you know what I mean? So I was using my platform, for want of a better word, to open as many doors as I could. So I started doing a podcast, started doing pre and post fight shows, started uh, doing weighing shows, started like, trying to work on an acting career, trying to do anything I could whilst I had a little bit of an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. So then by the time I came to retire, I mean, I, I, I've already got... But the 20 odd different jobs that I do now. Yeah, but that's a fucking good thing. Yeah. What was it like your first fight back with the one eye? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I lost to Tim Kennedy. So, I mean, I went from being sitting on the couch for over a year, being well out of shape and, you know, unfit and overweight. Uh, I called the UFC and they said, oh, we can stick you on a fight card in six weeks. And yep, boom, let's do it. Do you know what I mean? So I went from doing nothing for a year to six weeks later fighting. I went to a decision five rounds and, and got just got out wrestled. That was terrible. But it was an adjustment period. Like even now, like when I grab that, like the first few times I miss it. Do you know what I mean? Because I've got no depth perception. But, but I can see, the, you know, I can kind of judge it. But the first few times I miss. So in terms of fighting, obviously that's that's challenging. You know what I mean? Because I see in two D. Uh, so. Yeah, it was definitely an adjustment phase. And I wasn't even aware of it, but my coach at the time was, you know, he was he was working towards like trying to fix that, engaging my my distance and stuff like that. But because uh, I, I didn't know, like, I did a book, Quitters Never Win, and uh, the author, well, the author, the co-author, the guy that Ghost wrote it for me, Anthony Evans, uh, he put some stats in the back. And I didn't even know this. Before the eye injury, I had... A, I'd, I used to use my jab basically a lot, lot more. You know what I mean? But then afterwards, I wasn't using my jab. You know what I mean? I, I, I wasn't even conscious of that at the time. But obviously, that just goes to show because I couldn't gauge it. You know what I mean? Look, Rock Cold. How did you, were you not, did you not spar with him? Was it him you sparred with? And you made a slight little comment and he kind of pissed him off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we sparred together one day. He was the Strike Force champion, uh, which was like the next biggest organization in America after the UFC. And uh, I did an interview one day. Someone said, oh, I, I saw you were sparring with Luke Rockhold recently. How did that go? And I'm like, well, you shouldn't really talk about sparring. But let's put it like this. I'm the unofficial Strike Force champion of the world, <laughs> right? And it was just a joke. Did you see? Look at you. You're laughing. It was just a fucking light art in the mob. But he did not find it funny. He did not find it funny. So, yeah, you know, we ended up fighting. 
How was that fight for you? The when first one? You, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was... <coughs> sounds like an excuse. You said, it's not an excuse. Headbutt, why not? It beat me fair and square. I mean, so obviously this eye... I can't see. Anyway, just for the viewers that don't know. There we go. Boom. That's what you want, wanted, isn't it? So, because they're all like, his eyes look fine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, That's why yeah. I did that. If you see it, it's it's, it's a fucking mess. Anyway, uh, so this eye uh, doesn't work. And then right before I flew off to Australia, the fight was in Sydney. Um, I was grappling and a guy kneed me in the head, one of my training partners, by accident. I opened up a big cut right above this eye. And when we got to Australia, when we were doing the square ups and stuff, he kept saying, "Oh, look at that! You got stitches in your eye, Mike." I'm like, "Yeah, so what? I've been training, you know what I mean." Uh, and I remember day of the fight, as I say, I was always worried, you know, that I was going to get rumbled because of my eye. I remember walking into the arena day of the fight, and as I walked in, oh god, I feel nauseous, too much coffee in an empty stomach. <laughs> as I'm walking into the arena, uh, like some of the UFC staff came running yeah. up to me, these two ladies, like, Michael, 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 the doctor needs to see you right now. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, doctor needs to see me. Why? Why? Something to do with your eye. I'm like, oh God. I'm like, this is it. This is the moment It'd I've been, been dreading. Rumbled. We're fucked. Yeah. Day of the fight. You know what I mean? So I was terrified. And I had to sit in this room and wait for the doctor to come in. The doctor comes in. I said, what's up, doc? He says, you can't fight with stitches in. You've got to take those stitches out. And he just took the stitches out and that was it. I was like, fucking hell, dodged another bullet. And then in the fight, after about a minute or so, uh, we clash heads or he headbutted me, whichever way you want to put it. And uh, the cup opened up and blood was pouring into this eye. And um, if you watch the fight, you can see it. It sounds like an excuse, but it's true. But I've only got one eye. And when blood was going into that, I couldn't see. It was just red. And I'd, I'd wipe it and I'd see for a second, but then more blood would go in it. And it's like if you put a tub of paint on a car windscreen and put the windscreen wipers on, it's just going to smear, isn't it? That's how I could see. It was just like a red blur. And then, you know, throughout that time, I got kicked in the head and fair play to him, he got me. Uh, but after that, I was very frustrated because I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't say, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. I would never fight again. So I had to, it was a bitter pill to swallow. So I had to stand there and say, yeah, he beat me fair and square. I was like, your mother, I was literally fucking blind at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. He seemed to have knew that your, your eyes were fucked. He seemed to have knew that yeah. what you were doing on the fight anyway, and you listen to him speak and you're kind of full of him. It's as if he knew because he waited and waited because you, you changed your yeah. dynamics of the way you used to fight. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, you just saw when I took that lens out, you could, it does, do you think people knew? Oh, they, of course they did. Oh, was it? Of course they did. I mean, I mean, as I say, without the lensing, you can clearly tell. And I mm. only got this a couple of years ago. You know what I mean? I didn't know these things existed. I actually went to the doctor. I wanted him to take my eyeball out and put a glass eye in because I was very self-conscious about the way it looked. Do you know what I mean? And every time I looked in the mirror, I just couldn't stand my reflection. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, so everyone knew about it. Do you know what I mean? And it was like the worst kept secret. And it was like, oh, you know, I don't know. I was still fighting though. Uh, like even George St. Pierre, when I lost my belt, he even said on the microphone to Rogan afterwards, he said, he said yes, uh, we know he uh, cannot see out of this side. So the plan was the left hook. I was like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> hey, hey, all fair in love yeah, and war. Exactly. When you got there, you kind of went on a win streak again. Did you ever feel that you'd always won a world title when you were growing that win streak and then you had that Anderson Silver, was it? Yeah. He was a tough bastard in himself. Yeah. But did you feel that you were always going to win a world title? No, I didn't. Why? To be honest, I mean, I, obviously that was always the plan. I was always working towards that. And if, if that would happen, fantastic. And of course, you know, I, I got to, I was in like three or four number one contender fights prior to being the champ. And I was proud of that in itself, you know, just to be a professional fighter and get to a number one contender fight. That's an achievement by itself, you know, and to do that multiple times, you know, I was kind of proud and that was kind of like my consolation prize. That's what I would tell myself. Well, it's hard to be number one contender several times. Of course, nobody wants to be the number one contender. Uh, but I was, I, I, I was, I'd come to terms with my lot in life. Do you know what I mean? I knew I had one eye. I knew I couldn't see. I was still fighting. I was earning really good money. Do you know what I mean? I was like, if a world championship comes along, great. But if not, I'm still doing all right. Do you know what I mean? I've still managed to turn my life around. I'm still still having a fight career. And I was getting into my late 30s anyway. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, well, it's probably not going to happen. Of course, still 
still hoped for it, still worked towards it, still didn't give up on it. Do you know what I mean? But also at the same time, you've got to be a realist and say, well, well I'm pushing 40 now. I've got one fucking eye. Do you know what I mean? I'm probably not going to get it. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of like my mindset. If it comes along, great. If not, well, so what? Happy day still. And Anderson Silva, was that London? Yeah, yeah. What was that when you got to call to fight him? It was great. It was uh, Christmas Eve. And I was supposed to fight Gegard Mousasi, who's a tough, tough fighter. He's the Bellator champ now. And uh, Christmas Eve, I get a phone call off Dana White. And he says, yeah, he says, uh, we're thinking of changing up your opponent, Anderson Silva. I said, oh, fucking great. He says, yeah, Merry Christmas. Because <laughs> I'd always wanted to fight Anderson because he was the champion. He was a longtime champ. He defended the belt. I think it was like 14 times. You know what I mean? He was the best fighter that the UFC had ever seen. And I always thought I could beat him. And he'd lost the belt. He'd been beaten by Chris Wyman. But not really, because he was dicking about. He was messing about, and he got caught with the shot. That was all. But, uh, I, you know, I always wanted to fight him when he was the champ. Now he wasn't the champ, but still, for me, that was my world title fight. You know, I was like, right, okay, well, it doesn't get much bigger than this. Fine, at the O2 Arena, you know, sold-out crowd. Anderson Silva, still the greatest of all time. So for me... That was my world title fight. And that was the approach that I went into that fight with. So I left no stone unturned in the training camp. I was the most disciplined I'd ever been. And yeah, I mean, I got the job done, but definitely got a few extra scars on my face. Uh, it was, it, it was uh, I was cruising to a victory. I dropped him in the first, dropped him in the second. And then my gum shield came out in the third. And uh, as I say, I don't see out of this eye. So see if you're Anderson Silva, my mouthpiece gum shield comes out and the referee's not stopping the fight for me to put it back in. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm backing off and I'm waiting for the ref. And in the end, I turn, I go, ref, and I point at my mouthpiece. But see, when I turn there, I can't see you now. You don't exist. Like my hand doesn't exist there. And then when I turn back, he was in midair and he fly kneed me right in the face. And I dropped on the floor and blood pissing out my face everywhere. And uh, he thought he'd won the fight because as, as the knee hit me, boom, the round ended. So the referee jumped in and he thought he'd won. So he was celebrating. I was on the floor covered in blood. I'm like, I'm not unconscious. He's like, yeah, no, I know the fight's still on. So it was pandemonium. But uh, yeah, rounds four and five pulled it back. That really set you off those Michael Bisping has been a fucking absolute warrior <laughs> and the kids like people knew you then. I was no doubt all the fights beforehand, but that was the one that really cemented you as an absolute lunatic like <laughs> your, your, your <laughs> eyes were <laughs> fucked to be honest like it was wait so out like after you won that did you then think that okay i've got a fucking chance here or i've been no. the best in the world or were you yeah. just half or was that your world title fight you were you accepted that yeah it was funny ariel hawani you know he's, he's a big journalist in the mma world uh he even said to me he said he said michael he said you just beat anderson silver why didn't you call for a title fight do you know and it's a good question because I should have done because I should have made the most out of that opportunity but yeah I just think I was just overcome with emotion do you know what I mean I couldn't think past the next part I mean I was you know I was even crying on the microphone it meant a lot to me that fight do you know what I mean it was like a, a lifelong ambition it was something I always worked towards so at that moment in time you know with blood I had about bloody 30 stitches in my face do you know what I mean cuts here cuts there cuts there all over the place and uh I was just living in that moment. Do you know what I mean? After that, I, I was very lucky. I, I got, uh, I went for an audition. I got a part in a Vin Diesel movie, Triple X, Return of Zander Cage. And that was mind blowing for me that I got that part. So I'm up in Toronto. I'm filming a movie. You know what I mean? Like a legit blockbuster fucking Hollywood movie. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, well, this is all right, isn't it? <laughs> That's Life's, easier than Yeah, this it. is all right. And then, uh, yeah, you know, and then we talked about it before, you know, I, I, uh, I got an opportunity to fight for the belt at the last minute. How was that feeling for you? It was mixed emotions because I always wanted to fight for the belt. But then I, re I remember when I found out, I was because I, I asked to do it and I didn't think I was going to get the opportunity. And the night before, uh, you know, I went, went to a basketball game, had a few beers and whatnot, and I woke up a bit ropey in the morning. I was like, oh, fucking hell. Oh, God, right, I better go to the gym. I've got to be on set later. I'm all going for like a dickhead. Do you know what I mean? All right, so I'm going to go to the sauna. I'm going to sweat it all out. I'll be good by tonight. And as I walked in the gym, that's when I found out. So I was freaking out. You know, I, was, ah. I thought I've got, I get on the scale. I'm 30 pounds over the weight limit that I needed to be. So over two stone. I'm like, shit, shit, me and my mouth. I got myself in the right situation here. So then I run out of the gym. 
and I'm running through the streets of Toronto and I'm like, I've just got to run, I've just got to run, I've got to get in shape, I've got to lose some weight. And as I'm running, I start having all these negative thoughts. I'm thinking, this is just typical, isn't it? You know, I mean, I've wanted a world title fight my entire life and now I get it on two weeks' notice. I haven't been near a gym in three months. It's to a guy that's already fucking beaten me and I've still got to finish filming a movie and the fight's in two weeks and I'm 30 pounds overweight. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, this is just typical because what's going to happen is I'm going to get beat in the fight and then people are going to say, oh, he was never that good anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he was never destined for that. So I was like having many negative thoughts. And then Perillo, Jason Perillo, my coach, called me up. And he said, fucking hell, Mike, I've heard the news. So we were talking and I was telling him about, you know, my insecurities. And he's like, Michael, stop having these negative thoughts. He said, you've been fighting your whole life. He said, you've been training your entire life. He said, you just beat Anderson Silva, the greatest of all time, not long ago. He said, stop thinking like this. You can do this, you know, so, yeah. And how like how does that then come into play when you're going through all the emotions through your life? You've got two weeks notice. Like, did you think that helped you because of your character that it was kind of more pressure? Oh, it definitely helped. It definitely helped because an expression that Jason always uses is that I would mind fuck myself. I mind fucked myself my entire career because it meant so much to me. I wanted it so badly. And you want when you want something so badly and you obsess over it, it has a negative impact. Do you know what I mean? Uh like, I would train so fucking hard. Like, I've got no knees. I've got two total knee replacements because I just, I ran, I ran. I wanted to be in the best shape possible at all times. I was always the hardest working one in the room. I would be the first there, the last one to leave, you know. And I, I pushed myself to the absolute limit, but also mentally as well. I would stress out and obsess over the fight. And it meant so much to me. That was my only identity. It was my only way of making money for my family. And I, and, you know, I wouldn't mind fuck myself. He said, Michael, you, you mind fucking yourself. You're stressing yourself out. And I would. With this fight, I didn't have the ability to do that. Do you know what I mean? It was short notice. I, I was a 10 to 1 underdog. Everyone expected me to lose. I didn't have time to overtrain. Normally in my training camps, I would start and I would feel strong and explosive and stuff. But by the end, I'd, I'd be skinny. I'd be weak. I'd be overtrained. Overtraining is worse than undertraining, believe it or not, because you just you just got no strength and no explosivity. Uh, so, so, you know, but that was because, and it's, 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 it's a weakness, you know, overtraining. And another one that Prilla would always used to say, say, it takes confidence to take a day off. Do you know what I mean? Because then there's a fine line between having the confidence to take a day off and being a lazy bastard and wanting to rest. Having the confidence to take a day off means, you know what? I'm good. I'm on track. Today, I'm going to rest. I'm going to get a massage. I'm going to just do some stretching and whatnot. You know, when you're not confident, it's like, I've got to run. I've got to train more. If you see your opponent on social media training, like, ah, come on, let's go run fucking five miles. That's mental weakness. It takes confidence to go, you know what? I'm good. I'm just going to chill today, you know, but I would never do that. Anyway, long roundabout way of saying is that with two weeks notice, I didn't have time for any of that. And I felt no pressure. I was like, well, fuck it. Everyone expects me to lose anyway. I'll go out there. I'll swing for the fences, give him my best shot. How the fuck did you lose the weight? <laughs> oh, with great difficulty. No, do you know what? It wasn't, it was actually the easiest weight cut of my life. Why? Like for people that don't know, like we typically cut about 15 pounds, um, of water weight you know your body's made up you know, predominantly of water so if you know how to manipulate that you can temporarily dehydrate yourself and make yourself very light i wish we didn't do it in mma but it's just part of the culture um so i i had to lose you know about 15 old-fashioned pounds first you know so i i don't know how the fuck i did that but it came off and then the weight cut that when i dehydrated myself was the easiest process ever you know it was like uh, you know i don't know like it was meant to be or something. You know, I'm not that guy. But we need to like, give some tips to big damn hey, tongue, mate. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? It was like, it was like, shit, this is all going <laughs> rather well, isn't it? This is all going to plan. So how was it getting in there then for the, the fight of your life? Like the one that you've wanted your whole fucking life, the one you thought slipped away yeah. many times, like to be getting in there for a world title fight. Like, did you get nervous at any point or did you just feel fuck it? No, I, I, felt, I felt amazing. When I walked out for that fight, I've never felt so good. I've never felt so confident, never felt so calm, never felt so like just like present and in the moment in my life. And I remember when I when I walked in and this just shows like, because normally you're like, 
and you're fucking, you're, you're in the zone and you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's a crazy situation, you know. You're walking into the cage, there's your opponent, you're going to fight in a really vicious form of combat, you know, basically anything goes. You can't bite him or knee him in the balls or anything stupid like that, but other than that, pretty much everything's fair game, so you're going to fight properly, you know what I mean. Uh, the entire world's watching, there's 20,000 people in the arena, your opponent's hard as fuck. Yeah, you might be hard as fuck, but your opponent's hard as fuck as well. There's a reason he's there, do you know what I mean? And it's all posturing, do you know what I mean? You're like trying to pretend, you know, that you're not scared, do you know what I mean? And he's probably thinking the same thing, but inside you're like, fucking, what am I doing here? Why do I do this again? So you normally have all these crazy emotions, you know? On this occasion, there was none of that. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And I, and 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 this just perfectly exemplifies that because when we went to the middle, right, and, and the, the referee gives you an opportunity to touch gloves, I went to touch gloves and he goes, no, no touch. I said, well, no touch, no touch. And as I was backing off to my corner, I said, no touch. I said, I'll touch you in a second, motherfucker. And the fact that I was making a joke in that moment there shows like I, that I wasn't stressed out. Do you know what I mean? The fact that I was being quick witted, you know, and, and my normal cocky self shows I was, I was in a very positive mind frame. So what was it like to lift the belt, to be world champion and everything you've dreamt of as being a kid to come into that existence at that present moment? Like, what is that feeling? It, it's hard to put into words, you know? I mean, for me, you know, and I go into this in the film, it's, it's, that was my only identity. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's something that I've held so close to my heart, which is bizarre. It's stupid. I know it is. I know it's a personality flaw. And when I was younger, I was always fighting, but that's all I was good at. Do you know what I mean? And, and I wasn't popular. I didn't have any friends. Do you know what I mean? And, but then when I started being able to fight and being one of the bad guys, if you will, then I started making friends and everything. And then I started leaning into that character as well. Do you know what I mean? So I was always getting in fights. And I was always the badass or whatever. I've lived in America too long. Uh, but you know, you know what I mean? And I was like, that kind of became my identity. And that's all I cared about. And if anyone, when I was younger, thought they could beat me in a fight, well then fuck it. We're going to find out, aren't we? We'll, we'll meet tonight in the park, half six. Let's go. Think you're fucking hard. Come on then. And I was always doing that. And, you know, someone in another town, cock of another school. I said, well, let's meet up then. Let's figure this out. And that, that was bizarre. You know, it's stupid. There's definitely something wrong there. But as I say, that was all I had and that's all I was. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, to answer your question, to fast forward all these years later and that kid that's still inside me to this day, that, that still does in many ways hold that close to his heart. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, the, it was the best feeling. But it was not just for me, you know, for my wife. You know, she she supported me every step of the goddamn way through thick and thin, highs and lows, you know, because I've been a pain in the ass to deal with, you know what I mean? And she's been there every step of the way. So for, for her, for my children, for my parents, for everyone in England or the UK that supported me, you know, it just... Uh, it was it was an amazing feeling. Do you think you'd have lost that fight? You'd have retired. Well, that was the thing my wife said to me. She said, "Right, Michael." She said, "After this fight, are you going to retire?" I said, "Babe, if I win the championship, if you think I'm going to retire, you're out of your fucking mind. What are you talking about?" I said, "If I lose, I'll retire." I said, "But if I win, come on, that's a chance to make some proper championship money." Uh, but yeah, that was the plan. That was the plan. If I lost, I was going to retire, and then. Obviously, I didn't lose. I won. So my plan from there was, right, well, I'm going to try and defend this belt three times and then I'll retire. Uh, I, but I never I never managed to do that, but I defended it in Manchester. I had a super fight in Madison Square Garden against George St. Pierre. You know, uh, I had a good little run. How was the GSP fight? He's a legend, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, well... Were you bitter against that? But no, awesome. no, not bitter against it. I had I the best. He just came out with retirement, didn't he? Yeah, I had the best training camp of my life for that one. And this, I was honestly, I, I, I was, I was performing so good in that training camp. I was, I knocked out so many people in sparring, and that's not really something you should really brag about. But I was just on. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't trying to either. I was just fucking on. I, and everyone's like, "Oh, you're gonna fucking kill George St. Pierre," and that's how I felt. Again, mind fucking myself. Last day, I was supposed to fly to New York on the Saturday, on the Friday. I wanted to do another five rounds of sparring. You know, even though I was flying, I was in the best shape ever. I'm like, no, I, I, come on, let's do, let's do some more sparring. And I got three different training partners and every two and a half minutes, you switch. And uh, this guy, Dean Amasinger, one of them is an English guy. He, um, uh, he shot for a takedown, like his life depended on it and then landed on me and his shoulder <laughs> hit my ribs. And as soon as I landed, <laughs> 
I felt it and I just ah, screamed at the top of my voice because I knew my ribs were fucked. I was like, ah, and I couldn't move. And I went straight to the doctor and he says, yeah, it's not broken, but all your cartilage is like kind of ripped and stuff. He said, I said, so what can I do? He says, oh, there's nothing you can do. You're just going to wait. I said, how long? He said, oh, a couple of months or so. I said, I'm fighting George St. Pierre, Madison Square Garden. I fly to New York tomorrow. He says, oh, you can't fight. You can't fight. I said, doc, because with my situation, with my eye, this was a big fight. George is a big pay-per-view draw. This was going to be by far my biggest payday and help set me up financially. Do you know what I mean? This would have probably paid more than a lot of my other fights put together. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, mm. there's no way I'm pulling out of this fight, doc. No way. This is my doctor, not the UFC doctor. And he says, right, okay. He says, uh, so we came up with this plan. He says, what we can do is, he says, you can inject yourself with lidocaine right he says that will numb it completely you won't feel anything he said but the problem is it only lasts for about 45 minutes he says so we can't do it now he said you'll have to do it at the arena about 20 minutes before you go out and fight uh he said but you'll have to facetime me right and i'll walk you through it he said because if you get it wrong you can puncture your lung and die <laughs> I'm like, for fuck's sake so anyway so i'm like so he gives me a thing of lidocaine to take with me in a needle a syringe and I go to New York and I speak to the UFC first, uh, off the record. I speak to someone. I said, I tell them the situation. I said, I want to make sure lidocaine isn't a banned substance. That's that, that was the conversation I was having. That was why I, I was mentioning it. Cause last thing I want to be done is labeled a fucking cheat. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I, I said, listen, I've got a bit of an injury. And uh, my doc was talking about giving me some lidocaine. Is, is, is that an issue? And he said, well, You'd have to talk to the commission, he said. But the thing is, Mike, he said, lidocaine isn't a banned substance. It's not a problem at all. He said, but if you tell the commission that you want to use lidocaine, they're going to know that you're injured. And then if they know that you're injured, they won't let you fight. You know, he said, so that's your call. It's up to you what you want to do. And I thought, well, fuck that. I'm not telling the commission, am I? Uh, so anyway, so we go over to the arena and like, it's like time to fucking do the FaceTime with the dog. And I'm not there. And I'm like... <laughs> Fucking and that the the commission they're like the police you know like the athletic police and they watch you every move they watch what you drink they watch what you're eating you know and anywhere you go like two commission members follow you everywhere and I remember I walked into the I went to my bag and pretended I was getting something out and like slide the syringe and then I went into the toilet and like you know the commission coming I'm like all right lads I'm gonna drop a deuce do you know what I mean fuck off leave me alone so I sit in there and I'm like am I really gonna do this this is crazy so I fucked it off. Anyway, so I went in that fight and the first round or so, I, I, I wasn't good. And everyone's like, you weren't yourself. You weren't moving too well. It's like, yeah, I couldn't move. Do you know what I mean? But I'm not taking away from his victory, but that is the actual scenario that I went in there with. Do you think you'd have won if you weren't injured? Yeah, I mean, listen, George is amazing. He's a great guy. He's a class act. He's an incredible martial artist. He's probably, or if not the one of the greatest of all time, so uh, I, I don't want to disrespect the guy and say that. But yeah, of course, I, I, I think I would have done better. For sure, would have done better. Mm. <laughs> Definitely would have done better. How was it your last fight? You lost and then having to retire. Was that a difficult decision? Or did you just know, right, fuck this, enough's yeah. enough? Well, when I lost that to, to George, obviously, uh, you, you know. I, Why I'm, did you not retire then? I don't know. I don't know. Against a legend like that? Well, I, was like, I, I, I wasn't going to go out like that. Do you know what I mean? I should have done in hindsight, but um, I uh, hung around New York for a few days, just like eating and, you know, drinking a bit too much, you know, nothing crazy. I was with my family, do you know what I mean? We're just enjoying life, you know, just going out for dinner and having a bottle of wine and just, just, just enjoying myself. Got home and then uh, my wife's parents were staying at the house. They were watching my youngest, Lucas. So Beck and the oldest who could come to the fights. And, uh, so we went out for lunch with her mum and dad. And as we were driving to this uh, restaurant, there's a radio station in America dedicated to MMA. And we're, I'm listening to that in the car. And it comes on, breaking news. Anderson Silva has tested positive for steroids again. And he's out of his fight against Kelvin Gastelum in Shanghai. And they're currently looking for a replacement, right? And I'm driving and it's like a week after my fight. I'm still black and blue from the George St. Pierre fight. And my wife's there and my in-laws are in the back seat. I turn around and I say, I'm going to fucking do it. And they went, you what? You can't do that. You, Michael, you just lost. You just look at your face. You can't fight. I said, yeah. I fucking called Dana White there and then. I said, you looking for a replacement? He said, yeah. I said, I'll do it. He said, are you serious? 
I said, yeah. I said, one hundred percent deadly serious. So then I had to go do all the fucking medicals again. Ugh, that was annoying and time consuming and worrying. And then uh, fly out to Shanghai, China. Now, oh, this is a uh, you know, it's a nice roundabout excuse for saying I got bingoed. Do you know what I mean? But I went out there and I did go out with the intention of winning. I thought I could win, but I had no business being there. When I look back in hindsight, it was very, very foolish. I remember when I cut weight, when I cut that fifteen pounds, I, I caught myself. I was walking by and my shirt off in my hotel room and I just caught my reflection and I stopped and looked at myself and I was disgusted with what I saw. I was so skinny and emaciated and just like, just overworked and worn out and malnourished, you know what I mean? Like trying to make weight and stuff. And anyway, the fight starts and Bowie catches me and he, and, and he clips me and gets me and God bless him. And then after that fight, I was in a nightclub and I started having flashes out of this eye. You know, and every time I look left and look back that way, psh, I get a flash of light. And I was like, what the fuck? And I looked left and looked back that way, psh, flash of light again. And every time I did it, I'd get a flash of light. I was like, oh shit, I know what this is because I've been through it with my other eye. And uh, the doctors always, you know, always begged me, Mike, don't fight, don't fight. If anything goes wrong with your good eye, you're going to go blind. And I was like, well, lightning's not going to strike twice. It struck once with the other eye. But I thought, here we are, fucking lightning struck twice. And, you know, but uh, so yeah, anyway, that, that, that was the reason to retire. And how was that? Is that a relief for your missus? Oh yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She, she, like now, I'm I'm so slammed. I'm so busy. It's mental. She's always telling me not to work. As I said before, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, you don't understand. Someone has to pay the bills around here. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So yeah, when I retired, yeah, it was definitely a relief. You know, I mean, she she supported me the entire way. But for a man who can fight like fuck, who's known as being a nutcase, like. You seem to draw a lot of fucking madness as well. You've been, did you not get a gun put to your head? Oh yeah. In yeah. South Africa? In South Africa, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, shooting a TV show called Warrior and uh, we'd been out on a Friday, we had the weekend off, been out on a Friday night and had a few beers and uh, come back, I'm getting an Uber back to my hotel and uh, the Uber driver said it's, a, it's like a one-way system and we we're at a four-ways crossroad. He said, just, you might as well jump out here. Your hotel's like just there. He said, for me to drop you outside it, I've got to go all the way around the city in the one-way loop, you know? So it makes sense. But I'm pissed in the back seat and I'm not listening to him. And he says, yeah, yeah, hotel's just there. And I'm like, all right, mate. And I get out. And I didn't see which way he pointed. And I don't fucking know Cape Town, South Africa. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, well, there's four ways I can go. So I'm like, fuck it, I'll try this one. So I'm walking down there about a couple of hundred yards. I'm like, nah, this ain't right. This doesn't look familiar. So then I walk back. And I'm pulling my phone out and I'm I'm like, I try this way and I'm like, that ain't right. And I'm looking at the maps on my phone. I, basically, I'm looking like a fucking tourist big time. You know what I mean? And uh, all of a sudden, a lot of homeless people start coming out. The shadows, you know, there's a big problem with that there. And then I get surrounded by about eight or nine guys, all like homeless guys. And, you know, they're going... Um, they were asking for money and stuff, but they, they were talking to him. Like, he doesn't know where he's going. He, look at him, look at him. And I'm like, hold on, fuck off you lot. But they, they weren't being too bad. They weren't being overly aggressive, but they wanted money. I'm like, leave me alone. You know what I mean? But they, it was a little intimidating, but it wasn't too bad. I could handle it. Do you know what I mean? But as I'm doing that, as I'm talking, this car just fucking drives down the street, mounts the fucking pavement. And it was like an old cop car, but the windows were all smashed. It was rusty as fuck. But you can see it had been like a cop car at one point or something. <laughs> and it just mounts the pavement. Two guys jump out of the car, and this guy goes, shoom, puts a gun to my head and goes, get in the car, get in the car. I'm like, fuck me. And you want to say that, you know, you're all tough and macho in those situations. Fuck that. I shit my pants. I shit my pants. I, I thought I was going to die. And he just kept saying, get in the car, get in the car. And I'm like, I'm not getting in the car. I thought if I get in that car, I'm a dead man. If they asked for my wallet, I would have given them my wallet or my phone or whatever. But they weren't asking for that. They were trying to tell me to get in the car, right? And I'm like, if I get in that car, I'm fucking dead. Simple as that. And when I was going through that, all I wanted to do, because I thought I was going to die. So I called my wife. I called my wife as, as, as I had a fucking gun to my head. I called my wife because I thought I just will tell the kids I love them because I'm going to fucking die. Do you know what I mean? Honestly. And then, and then as I was doing it, because I just like, as I was like, doing, you know, you just push a button on your phone and it starts to ring. And then I thought, what a fucked up thing to do. So, oh, by the way, I'm about to, you know, I thought I can't fucking do this phone call. So then I hung up, right? 
but he's still got the gun to my head and he's still going, no, 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 get in the fucking car. And then all the other people are talking to him. He's going, yeah, he doesn't know where he's going. And right. And they start fucking arguing amongst themselves. Right. But as, as, as I'm standing there with a gun to my head, my wife's calling back. Right, doing my fucking head in. She kept calling and calling. I'm like, I'm kind of in the middle of something here. Fuck off. <laughs> Stop fucking interrupting me. But as I say, the guy with the gun was arguing with the homeless people. They were chatting. They're not the smartest people, let's be honest. <laughs> and when he wasn't looking at it, I just went, fuck off. I pushed him as hard as I could. He went, fl- I mean, it was a good push. He went fucking flying. He went flying down the street and I just legged it. I bet your knees were faint when you were mate, doing that. <laughs> I have never ran so fast in my life. And I, did it even change? chase me to yeah. be honest who knows maybe the, the gun was empty you, you, do you think you could have died if it took you in the car 100 percent. i think it was a ransom attempt i, I don't know about that but the, i 100 percent, i, I would have died when the woman that picked me up to take me to uh, the set the next day i said uh, you know i was all shook up i got into the hotel room <laughs> and I, I, I fucking broke down do you know what i mean i did i was yeah. fucking upset but when uh, the woman was driving me to set in the morning i said look i told her what happened she said, oh, yeah, because she, she was a local woman. She said, yeah, we don't drive on the motorways from 2 o'clock in the morning to 6 a.m. I said, why is that? She said, because what they do is uh, they come out the townships, like two guys will grab a giant rock and they'll just dump it in the middle of the motorway. So someone will be driving along at night, not see a massive rock, hit that big crash, then they run out the side of the motorway, fucking kill them and rob them. He said, life's cheap around there. He said, that, that's what they do. So 100%, if I'd have got in that car, I was a dead man. Thanks for coming on today, brother. Amazing story. Great talker. Yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. great life. That unbelievable career. Just before, where can people get to watch this? Yeah, I mean, listen, it should be available right now, I think. Uh, I think the release date is March 21st, which is any day now. Video on demand, so iTunes, Google Play, uh, Amazon Prime, all that good stuff. Uh, that's where you'll find it. So, yeah, check it out. Hope everyone likes it. Hey, cool. For coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Great man, great career. I know you're busy with the rest of the interviews today, but I wish you all the best for the future. God bless you. Thank you, James. Appreciate Thank you. it, buddy.